morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Brenda Perryman Show right here on TV 33, WHBR, Comcast 20 in Detroit. And today we're going to bring some things to the table. I have a guest coming on in my second and a half hour so we could talk about bankruptcy, other things, city services, all of those types of things. But one of the things that I had scheduled for you and I'm going to still show you this morning is of importance. It's a group of, uh, it's an author. Miss Jacqueline James from Atlanta. She was here, and I had the opportunity to interview her about um, history, about some black history books that she's written about people who assisted Dr. Martin Luther King in the Civil Rights Movement. And it's very interesting because one of the people that she wrote a book about is C.T. Vivian. And this was someone she admired as a little girl and how she got to meet him, that was very interesting. So we're going to show that interview and then we're going to bring some things to the table early today in just about 20, 25 minutes. So if we could have that queued up, this is an interview with Miss Jacqueline James. Good morning and welcome to the Brenda Perryman Show right here on TV 33 WHPR, Comcast 20 in Detroit. And we stream live at www.tv33whpr.com. And I am so excited today because my guest is from Atlanta, Georgia. Originally, of course, from the state of Michigan and the city of Grand Rapids. And she has done something that not a lot of historians have done. She has written a series of books, and it's going to be a series of 16 on the friends and cohorts of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I find this very, very interesting because Dr. King, of course, got the major, major, major press and he was the one well known around the world, but you know, nobody gets there by themselves. And he had wonderful, wonderful people around him, very courageous people around him. And I'd like to introduce you to my guest. Miss Jacqueline James. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Welcome to the D, the Motor City, Thank Detroit, you. Motown. Thank you. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm so excited that Ricky Welch told me about you and everything. And you're in town to do what? Well, I'm here. I have a book signing at Truth Bookstore to Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. And I spoke to a group of children at Brenda Scott Academy yesterday. Oh, I yes. knew Brenda Scott. She was such a wonderful, wonderful woman and a uh, very good council person. And she was also my sorority sister. Yes. And she was okay. just gone before, you know, the good die young. Yes. That's what they say. Mm -hmm. And Jacqueline, you grew up in uh, Grand Rapids, yes, right? Yes, I did. I was born there. I lived there. Over 30 years. <laughs> Over 30 years. Yes. <laughs> so you, uh, where did you go to college after you, you graduated from Grand Rapids? Grand Rapids, Ottawa Hills High School. Ottawa Hills. And then I went to Michigan State. I got a bachelor's and two master's degrees from Michigan State University. Okay, what were your uh, master's in? My elementary education was my bachelor's and my master's, and I had a a degree in special education. And that's oh, wow, that's and, nice. That's mm -hmm. really, really nice. So you were really well-rounded. Yes. You're really well-rounded. Mm -hmm. So did you stay in Grand Rapids? I did. After? I taught five years there. Then got married and moved to Lansing and stayed five years Lansing. there. Lansing, uh-huh. Yes, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. I taught five years there. Then I moved to Maryland where I was going to teach at Gallaudet High uh, College the elementary school at Gallaudet for the deaf, but um, President Reagan defunded the school so they couldn't hire any new teachers that year. So I did teach two years there before I relocated to Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. Yes. Okay. So when once you got to Atlanta, did you still, you continue yes, to I teach? I taught kindergarten for 10 more years, 10, 12 more years, then I taught 
fifth grade one year. Then I went into the library. I got a. I went to Georgia State and got a specialist degree in library media technology. Wow! So amazing. I, I was a media specialist for seven years, and then I decided I needed to go back in the classroom. So I always, I always had that special ed degree that I hadn't used, and they never had openings for deaf ed teachers, so I called and they had one. So I did my last three years teaching high school deaf and, and hearing impaired students. I'm going to ask you, do you like high school or elementary? Well, I love kindergarten, but I never thought I would like high school because I thought I was going to teach elementary deaf students. But I loved, I like, I like them all. <laughs> wow, I I taught high school uh -huh. all those years, and I loved it. Uh -huh. I loved it. A lot of people say, "Oh, I wouldn't do high school," mm -hmm. but there's something about them, and you're that last bastion yes. before they get out there mm -hmm. in the world. So and I what was good to me about that was I got them from the beginning in kindergarten, so I knew. And it always helped me. Teaching kindergarten helps you teach everything else that you have to teach. I can imagine. Yes. I can imagine that to be so. Mm -hmm. Well, what made you decide? Well, were you always a writer? Yes, I write letters for people who are in trouble. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of writing I usually do. People call me, I need a letter. I, I, my boss said this, my, my principal said this, and so I did that. But I always that's wrote interesting. That. Yeah, I mean, people call me from all over the country to write letters for them to, to save their job, to save different, to get them in places. I'm, I'm a good letter writer now. Wow. <laughs> do you still do that? Yes, I do. Oh, wow. That's... <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Hey, that, I may have to talk to you about that offline. I edit, I, I edit uh, term papers. I edit papers for people. I, I'm, I've been a writer, but I always, and I had my, I taught my students how to write. They always wrote books, little books and things yes. in school. And, but as I grew older and everything, I saw that black history was just disappearing. So. It was just disappearing, yeah. right. Well, I think about when you and I went to school. I don't know if your school was like mine, but they taught very little black history, if yes, any. It was. Yes. Especially my school, it was, if any. Yes, um, I understand. Yes, that's what happened at my school also. So it's very important, of course, you know, as I, as I started teaching in the 70s, that was more about Martin Luther King, Langston Hughes, and so forth mm -hmm. and so on. But they didn't have anything on the supporters. No. Nothing on the supporters. And no. what we have here, we have three books that Miss Jacqueline James has edited. And a former student of hers, Lameek Wilson, he did the illustrations. They are beautiful books. And I'm going to talk about each one briefly. Yes. But I, and the importance. Now you have, and this is very a very interesting story. You have Reverend C.T. Vivian. What made you decide to do his first? And this is like a biography, right? Yes, they And are it's all for what grades? It's for fourth grade and up all the way through high school, but I'm finding it's for adults also. There was an adult here this afternoon, and he said, this needs to be for adults too because I don't know this history. So, but fourth through on up can read the book. Second, third, first graders, Teachers are reading it to the students and then discussing it with them. The vocabulary is too, too uh, advanced for them, but they can understand it if the teacher reads it and discusses it. With and them. reads it, shows them illustrations, asks them what they think, because critical thinking is so important, as yes. you know. Mm -hmm. So t you have an interesting history with Reverend Vivian. Yes, I do. Why don't you tell our audience? Okay, I don't know how many people know about the incident with Reverend C.T. Vivian in Alabama in 1965. He, it, it went all over, it went nationwide, as we would say today, viral. He was trying, he was leading a voter registration drive and he got to the courthouse and this sheriff, a white racist sheriff, he kept talking to him and he wouldn't stop talking so he knocked him down, hit him in the loop, knocked the tooth out, I believe. And he got right back up and he started talking, kept talking, and then they quickly beat him up and took him to jail. Mm. Well, that little blurb, it was like maybe a half a minute, showed in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm sitting there and I said, what was that? And 
and they never showed. I looked the next night, and I didn't see it, and I never saw it again. So I was about to graduate from high school, so I forgot all about that. And then some 20 years later, I was watching Eyes on the Prize, and I saw that little scene again. And I recognized it, and I said, that's that man I saw when I was 17. And I got his name. It was Reverend Vivian. So I knew it then. And then 20 more years later passed by, and I was at... I was invited as one of the 25 teachers, guests of the parks, U.S. Park Services to be guests at the 40th anniversary of the march on Selma to Montgomery. <laughs> and the next day I was in the National Civil Rights, National Voting Rights Museum in Selma and he walked in the door. So I introduced myself <laughs> to him and told him how long I had known him and I was glad to meet him finally. And then I asked him, you know, I said, you know, somebody needs to write a book about you. And so he graciously told me, when you get back to Atlanta, call me and come on over and we'll talk about it. So as I was researching him, starting and writing this book, I saw so many other names and so many other support people for to Martin Luther King. So I said, well, I need to make a series out of this. Yes. So that's how the series got started. And so started. it's going to be a series of six. No, 21. 21 books. It's 21, yes. Oh, my goodness. Uh -huh. Wonderful. And we'll get into who those others are in a few moments. But can you tell us something really significant uh, about uh, Reverend Vivian? Sure. Um, a lot lots of people think that the 1960s were the first sit-ins uh, at lunch counters. In 1947, Reverend Vivian integrated the, the lunch counters at in Peoria, Illinois. He, oh, is, he started up for He did. Yes, we he had that here. I know yes. so many young people who went, so many of my students, they left to high school and went to Upward Brown, mm -hmm. you know, they were in that program. And he'll be 89 next month, and he is now back at SCLC as the president. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Isn't He's that the, amazing? Yes. Mm -hmm. So now we have, and a lot of us have heard of Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. Yes, who died to be two years in October, uh -huh. and I had the opportunity to, to meet him. The year before I met Reverend Vivian, I was at a, a National Endowment for the Humanities workshop in Birmingham, and he was the guest. And this is how naive I was. We had to write a... Um, essay in order to be accepted into this program for the summer. And they, only, they selected 50 teachers for each session across the country. So when you got there, everybody was from a different state, so you didn't know who it was, who your roommate was. So when we, and I had written this beautiful essay, so I thought, oh, I was going to teach them all about Martin Luther King, and I was going to do this, and I was going to teach it. <laughs> and all I can say is that Mrs. Boyer, the lady that was in charge and director of the program, she must have said, this child needs help. Let's have her in here. I got there, and they said, hurry up and get dressed. Our keynote speaker will be here. And when I got there, I leaned over and I said, who is he? It was Reverend Shuttlesworth. I had never heard of him. Mm -hmm. And I wrote all this. And then when he opened it, within 10 minutes, I was so embarrassed that I had never heard of him, that I, did, that I didn't know that he laid the foundation for Birmingham. He did so many things. He was there like eight years before the Birmingham campaign. He tried to integrate schools. He was arrested. He was beaten. His wife was stabbed. I mean, all kinds of things. And I'm friends with his children now, who are my age and a couple of them are older. We speak almost three times a week, the second daughter oh, and I. wonderful, wonderful. And she tells that at 11 years old, that was the first time that their home was bombed. Mm. And they basically lost their childhood after that because they had to be transported everywhere. They couldn't go outside to play. They, you know, they basically lost their childhood because they had to be guarded at all times because their family was threatened so many times. Wow. And I tell children, I spoke to some children yesterday, and I asked them, I said, how would you feel? You're 11 years old. You're 11? He says, almost 11. I said, if you couldn't go outside and play, you couldn't do this because... And it, it sinks in when they hear that, that they can't do things. Their freedoms are gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, the gravity of what these people did and the sacrifices, and we see so many people just sit down on it mm -hmm. now. They just sit down. They don't want to do 
anything. But then we have, and especially in Detroit, we have a community of activists that try to keep reminding the people that people sacrificed their families mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. for us to have the rights we mm -hmm. have. And speaking of sacrifice, let me tell you this. You mentioned my uh, illustrator, Lamique Wilson. Yes. He's just 23. He was my former student when I taught in the high school. One day we were working on this book, and I said, it just happened to hit me. I said, Lamique, are you registered to vote? He said, Miss James, you know it doesn't matter if I vote. And I mean, my blood boiled, but I kept my calm, and I explained to him why he should really? vote and everything. And he just listened to me out of respect for me. He didn't get it. I know he didn't get it. So a couple of days later, we were working on a page, and I told him about a page, and I said, this is the president who was the president when you were, before you were born. And I need a very, President Kennedy, I need a very disgusted look on his face. Then I need pictures of all these things. And he, he said, what is this? I said, oh, these are people dragging a little old lady. These are people with putting dogs on them. These are people choke hold, putting a choke hold on somebody. Somebody, they're putting the fire hoses on. He said, why? I said, oh, because they were trying to vote and they wanted to go in stores and sit down. And all of a sudden, I saw it clicked. He said, oh, they did all that for, for us? I said, mm-hmm. He said, I'm so sorry. And I said, why are you sorry? He said, because I said it didn't matter if I voted. Mm -hmm. And now I know it does matter. I'm sorry. I said, you have no reason to be sorry. We are sorry that we didn't teach you the importance of this. So if nothing else, that just clicked with him. And he's 23, and he had never heard of some of these things. So. I see it just helping not even children, not just children, but young adults and adults. Yeah. Well, our next uh, book is the Reverend Wyatt T. Walker. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about Reverend Walker? Yes. Hold that book up. Don't move. Don't move. Everybody sees that picture of Reverend Martin Luther King in the Birmingham jail. That's such a famous picture. No one or hardly anyone knows that Reverend Wyatt T. Walker smuggled a camera into the jail and he took that photograph and got it out of there. But what I learned on Mother's Day when I met him that he got the camera across the hall to Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King also took a picture of him. I saw that picture. It's not included in the book, but when I redo it, when I reprint it, it's going to be in it. Martin Luther, there's a picture of him in the jail. Oh and I had no idea. Yes, and the letter from the Birmingham jail, it was written, you always hear about how it was written on pieces of toilet paper and pieces of edges of magazines and newspapers. When he got out, Reverend Wyatt T. Walker, when he got out, all the pieces were there. He is the one, they said, he could only, he was the only one that could understand Martin Luther King's chicken scratch, I understand, <laughs> he had very bad penmanship. And he is the one who put that letter together in order because he could think he could get into his head. He put the letter together and that's why we have the letter from the Birmingham jail now. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Isn't that amazing? And Reverend Walker, is he still alive? He's still alive. I met him uh, Mother's Day. Yeah. Where does he live? He's in Chester, Virginia. Well, yes. this is wonderful and um, you are marketing these mostly to schools? And to everything? schools and libraries and mm -hmm. anybody else who wants to buy That's what I was going to ask <laughs> and you. Anybody else who wants um, If anybody wants to purchase them, someone who's watching watching the show, what would they do? I'm selling them through my website, Jax Publications, J-A-X-P-U-B-L-I-C-A-T-I-O-N-S, jaxpublications.com. And you can purchase it through there. Is there an email? Um, yes, jackspublications at gmail.com. Yes. Because these are just tremendous, and you you have 18 more 18 to do. 18 more to go. Well, actually and 17 more. The fourth, fourth one's at the, with the little meat. Yeah. And who is the fourth one? The fourth one is Dorothy Cotton, the first lady, yes, that, I was the first lady to, that I'm going to write about. Yes, 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 I'm so happy because so many people only know Rosa Parks. Yes. The great late Rosa Parks, mm -hmm. but um, Dorothy Cotton, okay. yes. she was very, very yes, She pivotal. was the education director, and her story is really phenomenal also, yes. Uh -huh. She taught, she was in charge of the education department. She 
once a month, she conducted a five-day workshop in a secret place that nobody, that they couldn't tell about because it was dangerous. They would have bombed it. They would have done lots of things, killed people there. So it was, it was kind of secret, like an underground society. And they taught them how to register, how to stand up and fight. How to, some of them didn't even know how to write cursive, and that was a requirement. She taught cursive to them. She taught reading and writing to them. And then they would, in turn, go back to their community and teach the community. Wow. And I never knew that either. I read about her, and I said, oh, this is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah it is. And, you know, Epictetus said only the educated are free, and the education director is a person to help yeah. who helped blacks get their freedom yes. get more i mean people think lincoln freed the slaves yeah. and that was all it was yeah. please the fight continues yes the fight does continue and you have dr dorothy height on yes. here mm -hmm. you have ralph and juanita abernathy yes. mm -hmm. harry belafonte yes. james bevel now who yes. was james bevel? james bevel he was um out of nashville tennessee and he worked he did nonviolent training. He did. He was a minister also. Mm -hmm. A. Philip Randolph, of yes. course. He was the one who suggested the March on Washington. Yeah. And see, we're getting ready to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that. Yeah. Yeah. And here in Detroit, we're having a march because Dr. Martin Luther King first delivered the I Had a, yeah. Have a Dream speech yes. right mm -hmm. here in Detroit yeah. at our march. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. gee, it gives me chills, really, mm -hmm. yeah. to see the pictures and photos and stuff. And a lot of people don't realize how Dr. King was here so much mm -hmm. visiting with Reverend C.L. Franklin, so many of our historical figures. And there's one other couple I'd like to tell you about. Okay. It's uh, so Sullivan and Richie Jean Jackson. I have a friend who is a librarian in a public library, and every year he has what he calls Jubilee of Readers, and he has authors come in, and they talk about their books, and then you can purchase them. Mm -hmm. Well, not last year. year before last, I was there, and... Um, I was sitting there, and I said, I asked the lady next to me, I said, who's the authors today? And she said, oh, that lady said that book, that is. She said, that lady, I said, that little old lady right there? She says, yeah. I said, what did she write? And she said, she wrote a book about the house by the side of the road. And I said, house by the side of the road? I looked at my boy, I said, you got me out of the bed to listen to a house by the side of the road? The little, little lady got up. She started talking. Her house is in Selma, Alabama, Alabama, and that is the house where Martin Luther King stayed every time he went to Selma, all the time. He, she said he never even brought a bag. He got in her husband's pajama drawer, and he got his pajamas out of there. He never brought a bag, suitcase in, because he had everything there. And everybody on my list, with the exception of two or three people, have stayed in her house. Isn't that amazing? And I told Miguel, I said, I'm so sorry, I was mad at you. <laughs> so I went and I talked to her and I asked her, I said, well, you were truly a friend. You and your husband, can I add you to the list? And she said, by all means. Yeah. Well, this has been <laughs> phenomenal. I mean, I am so happy that I got the opportunity to meet you and mm -hmm. to highlight you and regale you because <laughs> th you are a wonderful person. You are a significant person because mm -hmm. anyone who spreads the word, word and you are a griot, yes. uh, mm -hmm. is just so instrumental and so important to our society, our community, especially now. Mm -hmm. And once again, how can people purchase these books again? We tell the audience. Jackspublications.com, J-A-X-P-U-B-L-I-C-A-T-I-O-N-S.com or jackspublications at gmail.com. And I also have a number 404-241-4JAX, that's 4529. Let's, let's get the straight numbers yes. again. 404-241-4529. So if you want to reach Jacqueline James, if you even look at this as a teaching tool for your community center, your schools, or anything, 
please give her a call because this is a wonderful book. And we all know as educators that you can take from this and do so many other things, have the kids reenact these, write on these and everything. Jacqueline, thank you so much. Thank you. And mm -hmm. visit Detroit again. I will. And visit thank my you. show again. Okay, I will. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>
I know it's a long way away, but we also got to have a big turnout this August 6th, building up to getting rid of Rick Snyder next November. Well, you know, I feel so bad for the pensioners. I mean, like I saw a lady on television this morning, she retired from Detroit and so did her husband. And if they take their pension, they have nothing. I, it's nothing worse than to work and to have your pension put away and everything, but there's been so much mismanagement. But I read something this morning, I was just telling you about it, and it says here the bankruptcy filing exposes personal information of Detroit cops and firefighters, which is not a good thing. It's exposing, it says the city's historic bankruptcy case exposed the names and house addresses of police officers and firefighters, a controversial move that could subject them to unwanted attention or worse. I mean, it's like Big Brother, it's all over the place. Yeah, a lot of them, when you look at their address, you're going to find out they don't live in Detroit. Right. So there's 21,000 retirees collecting out of this pension, and how many of those live in Detroit? So. Uh, the, you know, it's it's a it's time for the truth to come out on a lot of levels. We're going to stand up for and protect uh, people who have worked hard for their pensions. You know, th we should work that out through the collective bargaining process. Uh, Mr. Orr, well, like you said, they're trying to get rid of the union. I yeah, mean, but they should have the talked. The, the, the union negotiators have been sacrificing and doing concessions over and over again, and they're circumventing the collective bargaining yes. process. But the point I'm making is, these folks need to move back in Detroit. The, our police and fire need to live in Detroit. I know there's a residency law, but we got to reverse that law. That's a I big agree. problem. I agree because if you live in Detroit, you have a vested interest, and then you'd be more concerned about what happens. But, I mean, so many live outside of Detroit. Yeah, and 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 the and the this is going to be this is a fight over a small pot pot pot, pot of money, um, the creditors. I guess they feel like the bankruptcy, I guess they told Snyder go ahead and file bankruptcy because they feel that's the better way to go after the unions and the pension funds. So I think it probably boils down to that, why they've gone in that, because the the, the, the pension fund police and the city workers' pension funds were ready to file, a, 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 have an emergency hearing to, to hold up this bankruptcy filing. Well, and they, they circumvented that by filing early. They said the Detroit filing bankruptcy was a race to the courthouse. And it was a matter of them getting to the courthouse before the unions did, because you know the unions and the pension they filed suit because of what is going on. They were trying to file suit. It's it's just a shame. And, and there's a lot of legal hurdles. Uh, the state's going to have to prove. They're going to have to prove that the city really is having a financial crisis. There is insolvency. Ed McNeil from ASME raises the point. Well, how do we find all this money for these out-of-state consultants? How do we find two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars from Gary Brown, who who stepped down as a council member, making eighty? And now it's making 225. So it's all going to be put on the table. So we're, it's time to, you know, be part of a transparent process. Yeah, let's see where the money is because we have some candidates who are running for mayor saying, oh, well, we have money. We didn't need to file bankruptcy. Now we will find from some outside source whether or not we have it. And where, like you said, where do we get the money for the law firms? Have you seen those lawyer fees? Yeah, and there's a straight-up conflict of interest there. And you had oh, Mr. Orr have our sellout counsel, not talking about Mr. Kenyatta, Joanne Watson, or Brenda Jones, you know, push that Jones Day contract through. We could have had a local Detroit firm. You know, bankruptcy law is not that complicated. There's a statute. There's some statutes that govern it. We could have had a Detroit-based law firm handle that for us. I, I, it's sick how they continue to send dollars out of our local community and we we can't put up with it anymore. We got to get rid of Rick Snyder and we also got to put in some strong people on August 6th. Very strong. Very strong. Let's talk about August 6th. Um, as far as, would you explain to people about districts and at large, please? Well, this this time there will be nine council members st still, but this time you'll get to vote for Two people citywide and then one for your district. There's seven districts. After the Charter Commission validated proposal uh, C, uh, the council by district proposal that went, took us to districts. So again, there'll still be nine. So when you get your ballot where it has the city council, you can vote for two at large. And I'm, one of the people I'm voting for is David Bullock. I'm considering Monica Lewis Patrick, and there's also Brenda Jones, who's been a good incumbent. Are it, those a large candidate? Yep, so you get to pick two there. And then you get to pick one for, for your district. I'm running in um, District 6, which is many people call the Southwest Detroit District. Would you, the boundaries, please? It runs from uh, Randolph downtown, 
past Woodward all the way along the river down to 48217 to the River Rouge border. Everything heading along the Dearborn border all the way to Oakman and Grand River coming back to Midtown. Everything along from Wayne State area by Midtown up 94 and Warren, all the number streets. Um, we got Joy and Grand River. We got uh, Alaska. We have all. I, I'm, I'm starting to learn every Alaska. street. Alaska. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a street. We got Vancouver Court. Oh, I know where that. I actually know where that is. Mm. I used to live over near there. Yes. Yeah, I know where Vancouver Court is, so I feel good about that. And we that. got American Street, which Charlie the Duff would his oh, I know sorry, what, but oh. called the worst street in America. But when I walk down the street, you have you have people there who stayed in Detroit. My who cousins keep up lived there. Yeah, on American. That's one of the best. That's the best street in America. I mean. This media, we're gonna have to, we have to, we have so many fights. Well, on our you hands. know the thing this with Charlie LaDuff, and I will say this: he has so many fans, but I'm not a fan. Oh, he's funny. I he's entertaining. Oh, I can't drink. But the, the truth is, the truth is used sparingly on his. Sometimes love, so. you have to look at whether or not someone is mocking you, also. And I think sometimes he tends to mock. Have people jumping out of bushes like we live in a jungle. It's offensive. It's very offensive. Now, Isaac, you went to Renaissance High School, right? Yeah. And, uh, did you go to Cass? No, I went to St. Teresa. Okay, I, I went to St. Leo's over oh, on did you? 14th and Warren. My ex-husband did. Really? Uh, yeah. Was he a football star? Well, he went to St. Cecilia's, and he did make a little <laughs> kick up well, a little Well, St. Leo's, we had a good basketball team. I was a little short shooting guard. When I went to Renaissance, I was I became a center. I have a picture in my literature where I was actually skinny. Well, and those are the core center neighbor, core neighborhoods, core neighbor, core. I think it's core city, core city neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And um, so, what do you think as, as far as this next? Let's talk about city council quickly. If you have any questions for Isaac or myself, you could call at three one three eight six eight zero three four two. What do you think as far as the city council candidates? I mean, I think we need some who won't table everything or won't put it in I, it was like kick i hate to use that term kicking the can down the road but that's what it seemed to have what seemed to happen detroiters are ready to make the tough decisions and sacrifices but there's a disconnect from what people are pushing and communication with constituents for example the bell isle situation if it if it means keeping control of bell isle a lot of constituents are open to putting a temporary toll on bell isle but we could run it ourselves a temporary toll maybe exempt seniors seniors get in free have a small fee and that'll generate some revenues you know we never want to put a, a charge on bell isle but you know there's state parks that do but let's keep control of our assets let's do things ourselves so that's where when somebody like myself or bullock we're at the table we're going to talk with the community and put alternatives. When Snyder and his, his uh, Republican cronies and friends come up with an idea, we need to have a counterplay that is a compromise or a different position that we can move the ball. We're going to have to make tough decisions. We need people who don't owe anybody. We have a caller on the line. Good morning. Hello? Good morning. Hello? Hi, how are you, Isaac? Oh, just fine. Good morning. Hi, Mrs. Uh, Perriman. Hi, who am I speaking with? Miss Clark. I can't hear you. Miss Clark. Oh, how you doing? Val I'm Clark, right. the one and only. <laughs> I'm going to get you, Isaac. Uh, okay, um, Miss Isaac, this question is for you. There was a young lady called in on um, right before Miss Perriman's show, because I got an absentee ballot, and uh, she was saying that she had the commissioners uh, for police but I don't have them on my ballot. So why is it that she said she lived in District 5, she had three on her ballot, but on my ballot I was looking for the commissioners as well. What district do you live in, Val? I beg your pardon? What district do you live in? One. Um, what probably happened was nobody from your district had the sufficient number of signatures to, to um, get on the ballot. Or only two people file which means there's going to be no primary because two people in that race will make it through the primary so let's say for example in my race for city council if there was only two of us we wouldn't have been on the ballot because two make it through the primary so it's either one of two things one is um, no one filed for the position or only two people filed and they automatically go on to November Oh, okay, because I was wondering, because I was like, oh, wow. Okay, and then um, she was saying something was on the back of her ballot, and I was like. Well, I think I heard her say that nothing was on the back of her ballot. 
She said she turned it over and nothing was there. Well, I thought she said something was there. Okay, well, okay, maybe I misunderstood what she said. Okay, then that's what I wanted to ask. We hope people will look on the ballots in District 6. There's this handsome guy named Isaac <laughs> Robinson running. Six I'm five so proud that I'm not grade. in District 6. <laughs> Well, I heard that you were uh, you traveled through District Six passing out my flyers, so I thank I, you. You know what? Uh, and uh, I do do that, <laughs> but um, but yeah, but like I said, that's what I want to find out. So, with that being said, I'm going to sign off, and uh, I hope that everything work out, you know, for you and your district, Isaac and um, Mrs. Pearman. Thank you for having him on, and thank him for explaining everything to us. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, oh, bye-bye. Bye-bye. You know, there was a question earlier about that ballot because the lady called in and she said um, that she had the two, at, she had the at-large, but then and then she had one, you know, the district, and she thought she could vote for somebody in all the districts, you know. We have a call on the other line. Good morning. Good morning, my wise and progressive friends. Ah! Morning. Hi. I uh, I'm in District Five, so I can't vote for you, Isaac, but I do support you. I know you got friends over there. Absolutely, and you know, this morning the lady was talking about the two at large positions, and when you can vote for up to two, but I am plunking for Monica Lewis Patrick, another strong candidate for. City Council. Yeah, that's a great strategy if you want to make sure your candidate gets through because that final four is Absolutely. what we we'll have to choose from. You know, and you know David Bullock is running, um, and I think he's also a progressive uh, social justice person. Monica Lewis Patrick is so intelligent, so um, just persuasive. And in a real fighter a lot of city and knows the City Council back and forth. Have a blessed day. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you. So on the ballot. It's they have the at large the people running for at large right, and then they'll have the person the people who are in your particular district. They will not have people from all the other districts. Right. It'll it'll like for District Six. It'll have the, the at large candidates Bullock, Monica Lewis, Patrick, Brenda Jones. You get to pick up the two, and then it'll come down to Isaac Robinson with a whole bunch of. Uh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, I'm running uh, against. Oh, you're running against Huey, Dewey, and Yeah, Louie. but I don't think they're working But you know, hard. Isaac, I've known you a long time, and you've worked so hard in the community. I'm not trying to give you that major shout-out, but you have worked in the community. You've stayed in the community. You didn't jump out of the community. And we have a caller on the, other, on the line. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Turn your radio television down. Hello? Hello? We're ready for Hello, you. Brenda? Yes. This is Rick Welch. How you doing? Hi, Ricky. How you doing? Pretty good. First of all, it's an interview with Jackie. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, her school together. She, you have to turn your television Ricky, down. Ricky, we still hear your television. You still hear it? Yeah. I, I got it all the way down. Okay. But I did give you a shout-out on that one. I know it. I'm so impressed with it. I'm very impressed with it. Do you have a question for Isaac, or do you want to speak on the bankruptcy or anything? Sure, what you bring. Huh? Okay, I could hear you at first. Do you want to speak on the bankruptcy or anything? How you feel about it? You got a question? I'm about we got a terrible connection. Oh well, you could call back. Why, why don't you call back? I think that's what I'll. Uh, yeah, call, call back call. on your landline. Call. call on I'm your landline eight six eight zero three four two. Or okay. Okay. Bye -bye. okay. But um, so. People should not, if I'm in District 4, I should not have people from District 6 on mine. So nope. that's it. You may like a candidate, but they're not in your district. Yep, and, and I, I'm inviting everybody to my cabaret. I'm having a Oh, cab yeah, let's talk about your cabaret party over here, and it's in Detroit, it's of the, course. It's called the Ticket Cabaret, because you need a ticket. Yeah, that's the ticket, the Robinson ticket. 
uh, Saturday, August 3rd. Music by Maestro. It's going to be at the old Diamond Shaft on Myers. Um, and, that, you know, it's Saturday, August 3rd, 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. It's $10. Uh, we do have some free tickets. You know, if you ain't got no money, come on out. I want to see if you can ballroom. I can do the Cupid Shuffle. Um, I can do the big man dance, which is, you know, you just oh go Lord, left or right. Big man and dance. Then if a, and then if a woman can know how to dance, it makes you look good because she's doing all the spinning. And she does the splits like I do. And she she do, That's an AKA, so we know, know she'd probably bring her steppers out. I know. Hey, Watch out. I did it. Okay, um, we have a call. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Hi. I wanted to ask Isaac, and uh, I know he's a lawyer and everything else, but could... Uh, we think that Snyder it may have shot himself in the foot with this bankruptcy thing. Could this really turn around and really backfire on him? Well, the, he has less control over the process once the federal courts take over. So we got to really look at the law and see, you know, how this is going to work out. We have a, we have some precedents down in Jefferson County, Alabama. We have Stockton, California. Never anything as big as Detroit. So we got to jump in this fight and tell our story. We're going to get down to the facts. Ed McNeil says maybe there isn't as big as a money problem. You know, maybe Governor Snyder is going to is going to show that we really aren't insolvent. You know, when you owe 14 billion or 20 billion, as time, you know, I, I, I and I'm not want to get into the mayor's race, but Mr. Barrow often talks about this money is owed over 30 years. So you're talking about a 14 to 20 billion dollar debt, but it's not all owed today. Right. We have a $330 million deficit for this year, but if Governor Snyder sent that money to state Otis, it'd be sure it would be brighter. So you have these Republicans in Lansing who are, are making it worse for us. They're taxing our senior. I mean, it, it's a mess. But yeah, you, I think, you know, it's funny when, when people do wrong, that karma is a mug and, and it may come back to bite them. I think, you, I hope you're right. That's what I'm thinking. And that's exactly what I'm thinking because I've seen it before. I've been in this world, not that long, but long enough to see that eventually, you know, slippery could only slide so long. Governor Snyder has come in here and just totally dismantled not only Detroit, but this entire state. And that man has got to go, and I hope everybody saves up their energy so we can ch chop the head off of this snake. This man has got to go. He does not know what he's doing, and he's made a mess of this state. I mean, we got right to work, which we never had, this big union state. He's come in and with all these emergency managers. He's uh, tore up the school systems. I mean, everything thinkable that you could think of, this man has done and hasn't even been in there for years. So he's got to go. So and, I hope and that's why I'm encouraging that. people if they're willing to get back involved with their sororities or their forget re reclaim the NAACP and make sure our elect our vote is protected you know I'm the corresponding secretary for the 13th Dems we need more people from the community in the party we can't be controlled by party bosses the people have to take over our government you can join the Michigan Democratic Party at michigandems.com and if you are a Republican ride that elephant as far as you can because we need some good people in that party so right. do oh something get involved this you stuff know. that Governor Snyder's doing, hey, yeah, it maybe we can get somebody in. All Republican, when they pick it with your pension and messing up your child's school, it does not matter. There okay? was a time when Republicans, we had union people in that party, but they're so anti. I don't understand how they have a membership. It's a lot of hateful people, anti-union folks driving that party, you know. But let's be hopeful well, and organized. Well, I think a lot of these anti-union people, well. They like being in the union, but they wanted to, they elected people who were anti-union, just like the teachers. A lot of teachers voted in Engler. Right. And he was the and most... And a lot of them voted in Snyder, too. Let's yes, tell it like yes, it is. yes. But I, I was just going back a little history there. They voted in, and then they got mad when he made came down with the hammer on certain things. And a lot of people voted in Snyder and... I must say, there were a lot of people who just didn't vote. Didn't vote. They did. They went to sleep because they voted for President Obama, and they thought he was Jesus, and he was going to walk the water, and everything was going to be okay, and you'd have to come back out and vote. He needs help. He can't do it all by himself. And when you sit and let your local elections go because you vote in a national election, that is about the stupidest thing I've ever seen. The but local elections are so important. Very they, important, and we they, see it now. You yes, you see you see what has happened. And and it's and we're having a, everybody. We're having a meeting tomorrow at Considine. Uh, Richard Harrison is our vice chair of the 13th district. Uh, Martha G. Scott what is our chair. What time is the meeting? 11 a.m. Uh, David Bullock from. Uh, our, one of our key civil rights leaders. He's part of our district organization. Rainbow Park. Push. 
Yep, and, and, and Lori Parks from SEIU. Um, come on down to Considine. Our meetings a lot of times are quite contentious. but I heard it was like pandemonium. Yeah, but, but that's okay because mm -hmm. we have 350 people coming to our meeting every time who are united against Rick Snyder. We're going to have growing pains. M my mom told me in 1964 after redistricting, when, when African Americans took over or had a bigger role in that first congressional district, you had people turning the lights off, trying to disrupt it, but we got through that. There are people in the establishment who don't want the people to have a functioning Democratic Party organization, but we're gonna have our growing pains. You know, we're gonna have some arguments about Robert Rules of Order, but at the end of the day, we wanna reverse the stand your ground law that's in Michigan, not just Florida. Oh, Grand yeah, home passed it in 06. About. We're gonna have a, f a, a fight about reversing this emergency manager law. So let's that's come right. and have our little fight. That's democracy. I'm not afraid of a little debate. People get so, oh, you're acting ignorant. Yeah, I'll be ignorant, but we're uh -huh. democracy. It's a, d it's a democratic process. Show up, come on out, join the party, and let's fight and whoop on Snyder. And I think that council members should be elected who have some courage, some courage no, right, to some stand cojones, up and make the hard decisions. Mild people. Now, we gotta have some folks that can get in there and say it, do it. And I, and I and I I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be an access point for business, but I'm not taking their money. You know, that's I, I don't want no Manny Maroon money. I don't want uh, none of Rick Snyder's friends money. But if they're if, if they're gonna come to the table now, we can have a conversation about what are the community benefits, how, what jobs are gonna be for Detroiters, and I want to move the ball for business. That's but right. it's, but it's, it's gonna be to the benefit of the community too. And that's don't right. make it so hard for Detroiters to open up businesses. There That's have right. been problems with Detroiters opening up business in Detroit. And that I mean, no th sense. that has been a big problem, a big issue. And, and I hope that with the council by district thing, which um, some of our friends have opposed, it's here now, but it's gonna create an access point. So people that wanna open up businesses along Verner, Michigan Avenue, Jefferson, and Grand River that are in my district six, I'll be an access point to help cut through the red tape. I think and it's cool. Right. Cool in the gang. Cool in the gang. Well, thank you so much for okay, calling you know in. You're off the air now. Pardon? You're off the air. Oh, I am? Yes, I'm off are. the air. Yeah, they, they got somebody, some advertisements on this. I didn't, that's oh. because you didn't know it, but yeah, you're off oh. the air. Okay. Henry, you said I'm off the air. You are off. And it's 10 on 1, but you were off a little before 10 okay. on 1. Okay. All right. No okay. problem. Uh -huh. Okay, Bye -bye. then. Uh -huh. Well, thanks, Isaac. Are we off the air? Yeah, I guess well, Comcast is off the air. So, okay, Isaac, right, I'll you. talk to you later. I'll still get a copy of this I love the AKAs, oh. and I love the Deltas, too. Let's I, I have roll. friends who are Deltas. I'm at, but this I is the AKA, AKA day. All right, bye-bye. See you next week. So we're on the Internet show right now.